morning. Um, I want to first thank Christina for doing all the hard work, the behind the scenes. Um, I want to thank Kathy Miller and Miyazawa for this opportunity. And I just want to say good morning and welcome from sunny Mississippi. Um, I am the flute teacher up at Iowa State University and I play second flute with the Des Moines Symphony. But this morning I am here at my parents' home visiting them. Um, and so anyway, um, let's jump into Moise, right? So I thought it would be um, beneficial to give you a little background as to why I compiled these melody books. Marcel Moise's tone development through interpretation is one of our favorite methods for working on expression. Um, and because I was not familiar with those 90 melodies um, that he compiled in his method, um, I needed to know more background. And so as I started, you know, looking for, well, the names of the arias for one, so I could hear recordings of them and then hear the melody in its harmonic context and then try to place it um, and so I knew what was going on in the storyline and who's singing and what are they singing about and is it happy or sad? What emotion am I trying to convey? Um, as I started digging into that, I started finding out more and more why Moise put together this collection of melodies. And so to give all of us a little background about the genesis of tone development through interpretation, um, Moise was the kind of performer, uh, flutist and teacher that would find weaknesses or different things he wanted to work on in his own playing or with his students. And he would um, write little exercises, um, little things to work on them, as many of us do, right? And when he wrote De La Sonorte and his 24 Petite and the 25 Melodies, he also compiled tone development through interpretation. And we can kind of um, think of those as being our first four uh, methods that were devoted to expression because we had so many books already on technique for the flute. And so Moise as a student at the Paris Conservatory thought, man, I feel like the flute is just, it's weaker than some of these other instruments. The voice can convey such emotion and be so expressive. The piano, such a monster, such great repertoire written for it. Violin, he felt as though the flute um, lacked in expressive and in emoting. Um, and so therefore it was an area that he himself wanted to work on and work on with other flutists. So when he played with the opera comique um, for years and years, as you can imagine, he sat in the pit of the opera, right? And he would hear singers every night and he would hear a mu like just a melody beautifully played and he would run home from what I understand I didn't study with him but I've read up on this and he would try to emulate what he had heard that night so he would play through these melodies and um, he would maybe play it in the key he thought it was written in right and um, then maybe he would take it up the octave. Or if he was already playing it in the middle or the high register, he would take it down to the low register. And he would do, um, he would transpose it to harder keys. If it was in a hard, nasty key, he would transpose it to easier keys, um, get used to what it might sound like on pitches that lay really well on the flute, and then take it back to a harder key or take it back to a harder register. And so he used transposition and, um, going to different registers a lot in this, um, in his, in his book. Um, and so that's why if you look through tone development and you see the melody fully written, the 32 bars, and then suddenly it's like two bars are now in D major, two bars are in E flat major, two bars are in E major. Well, we're supposed to transpose it up a half step, up a half step, up a half step, you know? Um, and, and so that is one of the reasons why he compiled the book. Um, when he taught summer classes for Marlboro Festival, um, he, uh, from what I understand, the, um, he was putting together tone development through interpretation, but he used all of these melodies and the students, horn, clarinet, oboe, you know, it wasn't just for flutists, um, called it the melody book. And so um, for years, I started with the 
tone development through interpretation during my undergrad with Dr. Cheryl, Cheryl Cohen down at the University of Alabama. And she would play records, I remember, on her record player. And we would listen to different artists sing. And she has a gorgeous voice and would sing along with them. And then we would um, sit there and imitate and try to sculpt the phrase and do different things. Um, and then tone development through interpretation got put on the back burner for me until my doctorate when I studied um, with Julia Bograd Kogan at the University of Minnesota. And she was a moist student, I think seven summers straight with him. And so I started learning firsthand from her how he taught these melodies. And then it became more and more and more apparent to me that I really did not know these melodies. And so for my doctorate with her, we decided that I should put together kind of a study guide of sorts. And so my melody books are harmonic reductions and I've tried to make very simple piano accompaniments so that I as a flutist could play them. And so hopefully as our students um, go through four semesters of class piano that they too can play them. Oh, and if nothing else, just keep a baseline going. So we know a little bit of what the harmonic context is. And um, I also was able to identify the names of the arias uh, and um, find the text for those arias and do translations and give you a little bit of a setting for each aria. Um, and even the instrumental works, because again, Moise felt like we were inferior. I think there's a famous quote where he says, the kings are the voice and the piano and the violin. Um, the flute is merely a queen, a very beautiful queen, but only a queen. So his goal was to make us in the ranks of the kings. And um, he, when he published his book um, with McGinnis and Marx, for whatever reason, the preface was not included. It was probably something like, we're trying to get this thing published today. You don't have the preface. Sorry, buddy. So in any event, we didn't get the preface with his book. And um, his preface that I have included in my melody books is very, very detailed. But I wanted you to know that throughout looking up every melody and trying to find background and how did he teach it and what was he going after, um, I found yet another supposed preface. So I just want to show this to you. Um, and this one, it's two pages. I'll get my hand out of the way in case you want to read it later. Um, he also wrote The Flute and Its Problems and has many, many, many arias, like a lot of Rossini and um, Puccini included in that, where he has the melodies with the text underneath. And again, he knew these melodies inside and out from sitting in the opera pit, right? So I think when he taught them with the student, he didn't sit down and say, okay, you're Manon. And this is who you are in this opera. And you fall in love with this man and you guys run away together. Um, he might not have used that in his teaching because he already knew that what's going on in the aria is we've been together for a while. We're going to be torn apart by our families. We're saying farewell to our love. And so he's trying to help us um, get that emotion going because he knows that emotion. So again, my melody books are put together so that we know what's going on. So we know the emotion. And then that's how we can better use these melodies. So um, I wanted to read to you uh, th at the beginning of this intro that he wrote for the, um, he calls it actually introduction to the melody book, tone development through interpretation. And he wrote this in 61, right? I was born in 73, I didn't get to meet him. Um, but again, learning through his writings. And before I forget, I must show you if you want to know more about Moise, um, I would say join the Marcel Moise Society and then pay for all of their newsletters. Get those. There are so many um, firsthand accounts of Moise and his teachings. Um, I was able to obtain videos of some of his master classes with Julia and Carol Wincense, and oh, it's just phenomenal. So get your hands on that. Also, huge, huge resource, Kate Hummel's dissertation. Um, she went through and interviewed so many of Moise's former students and they explain exactly how he worked on these melodies um, with them. And so this 
you reach out to Kate Hummel and buy a copy of this. It's fabulous. Um, okay. We're getting back on track. I have so much I'm going to try to shove in this hour. And then we're going to play the flute some too. Um, in any event, he starts the preface that was not included. And this isn't even the official preface. This is just, you know, moist ramblings at some point in 61. He says, is it possible to find a better method of teaching than this? to acquire and to perfect those qualities, which until recent years were mistakenly believed reserved for only a few privileged instrumentalists. So again, our goal is to be as expressive as the voice, as expressive as the violin. Okay, so does that give you enough background into tone development through interpretation and a little bit as to why I did the melody book. I hope so. If you have any questions, I'm pretty sure um, that we can write them either on the Facebook feed or um, in the chat if you're on Zoom. So, um, okay. And I think Christina will probably let me know about yes. that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so let's take a look real quick at the preface that Moise wanted to include. Um, he has a description of each of the areas. So A, section A, is melodies 1 through 13, B is 14 through 22, C is 23 through 30, etc, etc, etc. And I'm going to read to you what he says for A, because we'll start on melody 13. He includes Melody 13 actually in his preface and kind of shows you how he wants to go through it. So this is where we will begin working on um, just how to go through this book together. So he says for A, the register is low, the dynamic is soft, piano or pianissimo, low notes, free sound, vibration by the lips when trying to crescendo. Try to keep the lips as relaxed as possible. Use a generous air column and limit the pressure. The same principles apply in the middle register. So I take away from that, play through this melody and don't force it, right? He gives us exact details on page two, how to work on these melodies. He says also you should see pages 24 and 25 in De La Sonorte. Down here, down here. And so in De La Sonorte, it says, play the andante right through with a soft tone, tone, pianissimo. To use an analogy with drawing, this will be the outline. He says to observe the tempo, no vibrato. Great attention to values, breaths and slurs. Take great care that in slurring over large intervals, there's no accent. Here, the melody will emerge, so to speak, in all its nakedness. And so in De La Sonorte, he's showing us at the end of the book how to approach a melody. In his preface, he's showing us how to approach the melody. And he even says, time number one, just play through it no vibrations of the sound. Time number two, we might decide to do um, a little detective work. If I were to be expressive on one or two pitches, which two or which one pitch is the most musical note in the entire phrase? Where am I going after? What do I want to make a special moment, right? And then third time through, let's add vibrato. Fourth time through. Um, and he, he says he would even on the first playthrough, where it's pianissimo and he's not forcing the sound, he might have that be several times. So every day just to awaken the sound without force. He also talks about how you are giving yourself time to think um, and reflect by allowing these two playthroughs. And so I found that very interesting. Like I had not even thought of using this as a method for just like warming up to the day and warming up to the sound and um, any of that. Uh, disclaimer again, I didn't get to meet Moise, right? But I've heard about his sense of humor and I've heard about his candor. 
um, and I've read about it. Breathing, just going to leave this out here. So if we look at these four breath marks, these are the four breath marks that he includes in tone development through interpretation. And I know I didn't leave it up there very long. I'll read you my favorite one. So first off, the V that's in parentheses is the number one. It says short, often to contribute. Oh, it's number two, sorry. Number one is the breath mark. Good, musical, often indispensable, being part of the phrase, it's recommended. And this is, I'm putting them in order. The second one is the V within the parentheses. Short, often to contribute to the expression, but also to help you develop intensity. The V, short, not always necessarily bad, but always short. We're getting to the good one. The breath mark that's in the parentheses. Discreet, conventional for lack of breath, but often regrettable. So, um, in my own teaching, I call these the oh crap breaths. <laughs> you know, that you make a good choice in a phrase. If you have to take another breath, where would it be? So I, I thought that was helpful to see that he has very specific ideas of why he has, you know, breaths marked different ways. Okie dokie. So we get to page three of his press press. He gives us additional suggestions. And then he uses number 13 as an example. How do I do this in detail? Let's see, there's his melody on the second page with the text down beneath. And this is where he says, play through it many times at Pianissimo. Okay, so why don't we try one of these examples together? Yes? Okay, as I explained earlier, um, Moise would use transposition so that you would start out maybe in a key that's very easy for flute, right? All the notes are in, in tune in that octave very easily on your instrument. And you would play through the melody and you would acquire exactly where you want those pitches to lay. And then you would take it to a more challenging key or a more challenging register where pitches might be a little bit wonky, but then you have the ideal in your ear. So um, I have gone ahead with um, taking my own liberties to transpose some of these for us into nicer keys for the pianist. Um, and I often find that if I can more easily play all the notes accurately on the piano and sing the flute line along with it, it sounds better by playing the right notes. So number 13 is our first example for today. So Christina, if, yeah. if you're able to share the screen, we're in volume one. And number 13 is on page 22. So if you scroll down to 22. I apologize if this makes anyone dizzy. Okay. While she's getting that set up, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you um, the key is in F sharp major and I'm going to play it in F major, which means for those of you playing along, cause we're gonna have the melody up on the screen um, for you to play along with just envision instead of 75 sharps, we're going to have one flat. The only note that we're going to actually have to um, adjust is um, in the original key in measure 12, I think is our first example, we have a B sharp. It raises the fourth, right, to B sharp instead of B natural. So since we're in F major, when we see that B sharp, we will actually have a B natural because we're raising the B flat to a B natural. All right, there we go. So, all righty. So here we go. Um, for those of us who like to know what's going on piano part wise, when I start us off, I'm whole notes and then the motor rhythm becomes half notes for a majority of this aria. So I was able to see Christina Jennings give a master class for UMFA a few months ago and she did a play along and we all played a duet with her. She just counted us off. 
And so I've been doing that in my private teaching online since then. And so um, for our warm up today, we are going to go ahead and just play with the piano part to begin with. But I want you to have this be your time number one that you're playing through it. So pianissimo or piano, whatever's comfortable, um, not forcing the sound and just seeing if you were to bring out one note or two notes, what are the most special? All righty. So here we go from the beginning. I'll count aloud as I'm playing a little bit. So two, three, four. Let's pause for a second. So we are about to begin on measure 20. So it is on our one, two, three, fourth line of music. 18 starts that line. Um, we can start with a pickup into 20. And what I want you listening in for this time is the counter melody. Um, and I'll try to bring it out again. I'm a flutist and I'm trying to play the piano, but um, oftentimes in lessons, I will play counter melodies on my flute because I feel a lot more comfortable on the flute, obviously, than the piano. So this is another way to work on these with your students. Um, since we've gotten into all this online techie stuff in the last three and a half months, I sometimes will record part of it even on my phone, um, you know, just the voice memo and then play along. So here we go. I'll count us off one, two, three. You're going to start on that G. Did we all make it through the B natural okay? There were two of them. I hope we all survived. Everybody's nodding, hopefully on their own. Okay, good. So here we go. Pick up into measure 20. One, two, three. So how did we do? How is our transposition? I hope successful. Um, okay, so Christina, do we have any questions yet or should I go on to the next melody? Let's see here. So, so far, everyone thinks it's very fun. Um, So Susan wanted to ask, um, is there a PDF available or a place to purchase uh, the preface that you showed in the beginning, uh, as well as she actually already owns your book, um, but does not have a piano part for it and just wanted to check if that no, is could, available with it. Could I, say, could I say something? Sure. Would it be okay? I have book one. And book two came with the piano part. Book one did not come with the piano part. Uh, did, did the clerk forget to give me a piano part? Or is there a piano part for book yeah. one? So they should only be sold together. And so that means that the piano part got omitted from your, you know, um, you should have gotten a piano part. 
I did not. So I can, I can talk to Carolyn about that because I'm sure you got it from her. Oh yeah, I did okay. at a flute convention. Okay, it should have. That would. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Right, and and I didn't mention this. Um, in the piano. Wait, that's flute. Ha! Ah, so many books up here. Um, in the piano parts, in addition to having obviously the piano parts, I've transposed like four different examples. Um, it's spiral bound, so it should look slightly different too. And I'm so sorry about that. So we'll get that taken care of so you can have piano parts. Um, and Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Good question. And were you asking then about the other preface, the one that I should yeah. have doing? Yeah, you seem to have an, an extra preface that I, it would be great if we could have that. Um, I'm going to, I can scan it when I get back home and have a scanner. Um, I'll hold it up again in case you want to take a screenshot from um, maybe with your phone from your home. Yeah, it's cut off. It'd probably be better as a PDF. Okay, why don't we do that then? Um, Susan, I know who you are, so I'll find you. Oh, um, is oh that okay. Good? I won't sure. be another four or five days, but then I'll make a PDF. And okay. I'll you. Okay, and if anybody Thank else... you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and The Flute and Its Problems is another one of Moise's books that's out there. And um, it has tons of ideas of how to work with the melodies also throughout the book. And so that's much more, uh, almost a textbook. And then he has the melodies um, throughout it. So that, that I found to be really interesting as well. Um, okay, so if we keep going, um, I was able to see uh, Gareth Davies from the London Symphony gave a warm up class last week and he did some examples from 24 Petite by Moise. And then he started in on tone development through interpretation with number one. And so um, it is interesting to me, can we go ahead and scroll? I'll get you working on that line. We're gonna go up to number one. So that is on page 10. Thank you. So, um, We'll go ahead and play this example. I should also mention my melody books, I put the first 30 in volume one and then 31 through 60 is in volume two. And I am diligently working on 61 through 90, I promise. I'm not quite done yet. So um, with the Oregon Symphony, Moise must have really loved this melody because it's as number one in tone development and number 31. So the irony is it actually starts both of my melody books. Here it's in our low register. It's number 31. It's up the octave. So it's in the middle register, which has its own can of worms to deal with, with tuning and all, just register stuff. So, um, okay. I wanted us to read a little bit about this one. Um, this is one of the examples where this melody is played by uh, low strings and then it's also played by clarinet and um, Moise really loved trying to emulate the floating sound of the clarinet with this example and so you know as flute players we know starting on a D flat you know um, having the middle D flat we've got some maybe pitch tendencies to deal with here um, so uh, it's got that going on with it. I tend to think of these um, hairpins as just being subtle indicators of what note is the goal of the phrase. So I don't necessarily think that it's necessary for us to surge like crazy from um, measure three into the downbeat of four, more that it's just like we're on a gradual incline and then a little mini arrival at the beginning of the fourth measure. Okay. Um, so here's what I want us to think of as we play this one. Um, if you look at the last sentence in my description, I've learned this from reading in Kate Hummel's dissertation, which you're going to buy, I know, um, that uh, Moise would use the words sacred, holy, and utterly untroubled to evoke the right mood. 
I was thinking lately, um, there's been a lot of unrest, a lot of fear with what's going on with um, COVID and the coronavirus, right? And then in the US, we've had a lot of troubles. Um, and so the idea of playing through this melody and that third description, utterly untroubled, to just kind of wipe the mind clean, whether you need to meditate first or take a few deep breaths, but we shall try this one. I, this is taken from an organ symphony. So my piano reduction is organ part. So if you imagine it having great sustain, which I don't on a regular piano, that'd be great. So let's try this one together. One, two, three, four. Beautiful, right? You can even play that one up, up the octave um, just to get the sound going. All right. Let us move on to um, the first one that I worked uh, with Julia Bograd Kogan, um, who plays with St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And if you're just joining us, she was a former Moy student. And um, <clears throat> Uh, she has us start with number 18, or she had me start with number 18. Um, and the analogy that she used with us, that Moise had used, is that we should have the richness in the low sound. Christina, if you could jump to page 27. She would use um, the analogy of a jar of mayonnaise, which I guess, you know, back in like 1915, 1920, um, mayonnaise at that time was more akin to, um, for us, if you were to buy natural peanut butter um, and it has the oil at the top and it separates. Well, at this point in time with the mayonnaise, I guess the oily, you know, egg and oil would um, kind of be in layers and you would have to stir it up. And he would use the analogy to go deep into the jar to get the ooey gooey fatty out of the bottom of the container um, to mix it up. So you want the rich, fatty, just juicy, ah, uh, yummy, even though it makes me feel kind of bleh to think of um, in our sound. So we start here on D, such a gorgeous note on the flute for some our favorite, right? And then as we dig down, we keep that richness. Now for me, um, let's go ahead and read the description of this one. So it's an instrumental prelude, right? So we don't have text. We don't have text telling us exactly what we should be thinking and feeling, right? Um, however, this is um, an instrumental part at the beginning of act four. And oh, this is where we don't know exactly whose emotions we are hearing in the music. But when you hear the chords underneath the melody, you will find it is very troubling sounding. The melody itself, when I played it, I thought almost was kind of happy. Um, so why don't we actually try experiencing the melody? Let's play like the first four bars together, just listening in for the melody without any knowledge of the harmony. And maybe try to wipe away from your memory what I was just telling you about what's going on in the background. Okay, so we have one, two, three. I think I played the first eight, sorry. Um, 
So we hear that melody. It doesn't sound completely disturbing to me or disastrous or and it's not um, filled with turmoil. But once we add the harmony underneath, this was a game changer once I heard the harmony and once I knew what was going on in the storyline I didn't know if I was having Charlotte's emotions or if she was trying to figure out what her love's emotions are um it's panic if it's sadness if it's both um but I do know for me I am a harmony gal give me a box sonata I don't need the cantata with the words I feel like what speaks to me the most is note choices and um, their interaction and their resolution after tension. But I know I have many, 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 many students who it's much more about the storyline and trying to figure out the emotion that way. And so um, I guess that's why I included both in the melody book. So we have like the full picture and the complete package as Moist would have. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show you uh, that while Maurice teaching this one, obviously might not have been talking about feelings of taking one's life and serious, serious and horrible things because he's talking about a jar of mayonnaise, right? And so um, again, I wanted to have this background information so I knew what was going on because he knew what was going on. And then on top of that, he's saying, hey, I'm using number 18 with you right now to help you get a juicy low register sound. I don't want it as you descend into the low register, the flute, where we might be airier or kind of weak sounding. I don't want you to wimp out. You know, imagine going down a slide, keep that rich sound going, or imagine scooping in the bottom of a jar of 1920s mayonnaise, you know, and get the rich goody out of the bottom. Okay, so that is a little bit that I want to share about number 18. I apologize if I'm going quickly. I'm just trying to kind of show highlights and um, things that were important to me in putting this together. Um, number 26. It's an art song, right? Still is the night. And I believe, Christina, I believe in the flute part, I have this in two keys. So we're going to look at 26, but then, yeah. Okay, so that looks pretty fun but we're not gonna do it in that key. So just keep scrolling and we're gonna to go to 26B. Because again, I'm about to play the flute part. I mean the piano part. Okay, so for me, F major, woo, much easier to play than C sharp major. Um, and so this was one of the first ones where I felt like banging my head against the wall when I was working with Julia. I was a DMA student. I was trying to shape this phrase. And once I actually went and looked up the actual song and heard the descending top line of the piano part, my mind was blown. I was like, this is the most beautiful melody on planet Earth. And so with my students, I often play the top line on the flute with them. And so what I would like for us to do is can we play that together with me playing the flute, um, the descending line, and you playing the part written? as it's written, starting on your C. I'll count us up four, five, six, and that'll be our quarter. And then I'll play it on the piano so you hear it more in a larger har harmonic context, okay? Four, five. So shall we give it a go with the piano part? One, two, three, four.
and then it's back like the beginning. All right. Before we leave this volume, I'd like us to jump up to number 12. And you are on it, so I don't need to tell you the number, I think. She's going the right way. Christina, you're a rock star. There we go, adieu. Okay, so we have Manon. And she has fallen in love. And she has escaped to Paris. And they're living together necessarily, uh, not with parental consent or support. And um, her boyfriend has decided that he, they're now going to be apart and he is choosing family. And so as she sings, basically she is saying goodbye to their happy times together, even though she's saying goodbye to our little table. Um, the words are, goodbye our little table at which we met so often. Goodbye, goodbye our little table, yet so large for us. Um, one thinks that it's unimaginable, so small a space, we huddle together. Goodbye our little table, the same glass was ours. Each of us, when we drunk from it, there searched for one set of lips for the other. Ah, poor friend that loved me. Goodbye, our little bit table. Goodbye. So it's about a table, <laughs> which we probably could have guessed from just looking at the French, right? And yet terribly sad. When I played this on its own, I think the melody makes complete sense. When, for me, again, when I've added the harmony, for me, this one had more to do with not only harmonic context, but also the voicings. And um, I've tried to keep this one very true to the original and it was made easier because it's very simple already. Um, but just listen to how angelic the piano part sounds. So again, I'm hit by their love is very pure. Her heartfelt remorse over their relationship ending is very pure. So we have two half notes in the piano part before we start together. And then it's basically half notes for the rhythmic language. So we have the measure before we come in is Okay, so now let's try playing it together, shall we? So that is goodbye to our little petite table. And with that one, I think we should leave volume one. Um, we can jump to, if, it, if it's okay for us to jump to volume two, 
Um, and if no one has any questions about that, I thought we would jump to another excerpt from the same uh, opera. Oh, the other thing is um, I have an opera synopsis of every opera at the back of the flute book. So if you don't get enough from the little scene setting and you want more background information, um, which I did, then um, you could flip to the back of the book. Okay, but for today, because we're playing more, um, let's turn to number 44. So it's a little bit farther down. Christina was just resting on number 41. That was actually the hardest one for me to find. And if we have time, I will share that story because that was a goodie. Okay, so number 44. Let me look in the flute part, which you have out. So I should just look on my screen. Okay, so what we have here, number 13 when we started, by the way, was a description of my great house and how he used to live there and his father had just passed away. And so he is thinking nostalgically about his house from growing up. And here we have yet another humble dwelling, a little camp cabin out in the woods. And we have a description of out in the woods and he is saying how beautiful everything is, except one thing is missing, Manon. So we've just had in number 12, the last example that we just played, the angelic, right? piano part. Here's how number 44 starts. Okie dokie. I'm going to try to count this off and then have you play. Oh, just remember I'm not a pianist. I'm a flute player. Okay. Fold the page. I've seen real pianists do this and fold the corner of the page and get all professional. Okay. So basically when we start in measure two, it's like and a two, and three, a four, a one, two, three, and four, and a one. So that's about the tempo of it because my part dun, 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 looks like that. And hopefully sounds like that. <laughs> so we'll try a little bit of this one together. stop there. So the the piano part for that one completely changed the way that I heard the the voice line or the flute part, right? Um, and really, really affected my interpretation of it. I should also mention, I love playing these um, melodies on my piccolo. And I've had to do much more piccolo playing in later years. And um, so those of you who are piccolos out there who just want more opportunities than just your sporadic playing in orchestral, um, I find they work great for this. And again, Moise used this with clarinetist, oboist, horn, um, everybody, right? So I think, um, I don't know what time it is. Oh gosh, 
gosh, we're running out of time. That is basically, in a nutshell, what I wanted to share with you today, um, to just kind of show how I work through the tone development through interpretation melodies. And, um, and just, I basically needed these study guides for myself, and that's why I put together the melody books. Um, but I hope this has given you some new ideas of how to approach um, Moise's book, because I sure needed it. And um, I hope it's given you uh, some fun today. So if we don't have any more questions, Christina. Yeah, I'm just waiting. I asked again to see if there's any other questions anyone has. Um, otherwise, you said both of these books are available with the flute and piano part. And it's from Carolyn Nussbaum, so flute and then the number four and the letter U dot com. Awesome. I think we should definitely all use a little bit of practice most, uh, motivation right now. Yes, yes, yes. And they can, they're just pretty melodies on their own. Mm. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for having me today. This has been fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sonia. I think it was a really, really valuable class.